I am thrilled to be here uh, because I am, and I am here because of the Hertz Foundation. So I'm going to tell you the story of the telescope and uh, the history of the universe and some of those things. But before I get into that, I wanted to say um, thank you. Um, I first encountered the Hertz Foundation in 1970 when I was a graduate student at Berkeley and I was going broke on my NSF fellowship. I couldn't afford all of that. And so um, I applied for this thing and I thought, well, that'll never happen. Uh, but uh, I got to go be interviewed in Edward Teller's kitchen in North Berkeley. And he asked me questions I couldn't answer. And I thought, well, this really isn't going to happen. But nevertheless, uh, somebody must have put in a good word for me. And so here I am. So um, I worked with, uh, with the Berkeley Physics Department to build this apparatus that went up on a balloon payload and actually did not work. Um, so that was pretty devastating. But I said to myself, well, the Hertz Foundation thought I was OK. Uh, my thesis advisor says I'm OK. We can write a thesis about a failed project, and it'll be all OK some way. So um, having the vote of confidence from the Hertz Foundation was of immense importance psychologically to me uh, when something had failed. And it gave me courage as time went along to try hard things, which I have now uh, now attempted twice. And the first one worked, and the second one was a, is about to fly. So um, the vote of confidence that I got from the Hertz Foundation made it possible for me to do both of these things. And I want to also to say um, I was so uh, so efficiently so so aware of this that when I got my check from Stockholm, the first thing I started to spend it on was the Hertz Foundation. So there is a uh, one of the graduate students who gets support from us uh, and Ray Sidney matched our donation. So thank you Hertz Foundation for making all of this story that I'm going to tell you my story. Something like this might have happened otherwise, but now I get to be in it because of you. So here on the uh, front page of the story, I've got a picture of the Great Telescope in space. Uh, it's showing you a great golden hexagon, which is six and a half meters across, which is bigger than the diameter of the rocket, which is only five meters. And that's how it's going to sort of be in outer space. I'll tell you more as we go along. Uh, this is the, the most uh, powerful space telescope we've ever built. And uh, we're counting on uh, launching it successfully uh, two weeks from today, or maybe a little bit later if there's a delay for the weather. This is a joint project of the European and Canadian space agencies, along with the web, the uh, NASA that I work at. And uh, it's an enormous project. Uh, the COBE satellite that was mentioned earlier took 1,500 people. On this one, it's at least 10,000 people uh, that is taken so far. So I want to tell you the story. Uh, but uh, before I tell you that story, this is uh, how I got my start in life. Uh, this is the. Uh, Rutgers University Farm, uh, it's an agricultural research station in far northwestern New Jersey, a mile downhill from the Appalachian Trail. That's where I was because my dad was doing research on dairy cows with statistics. And I didn't get excited about dairy cows, um, but I did hear already when I was about six years old that uh, Humans are made of cells, and the cells have DA, DNA in them with genes that tell the things what to do. So when you get your inheritance, that's part of it. And uh, I thought, even uh, when you're six or seven years old, you can say, well, that's interesting, but it isn't exactly fair. We don't all get the thing, same thing. So still have an interesting challenge today with people who think about that question. Anyway, it was dark uh, there. The sky was beautiful. I could see stars and comets. And I got all the books on science that I could get from the bookmobile that came around every two work weeks to the farm. And um, I actually did study statistics for my dad. Uh, one, that's the one scientific collaboration that we ever had because I had a ninth grade biology project studying the feeding of rats. The conclusion of that, by the way, is cornflakes is not a sufficient food. Anyway, got my start there. Uh, and I was a, very aware of some of the great questions of life, even back then. Um, and this is my modern version of, the, of them. How did we get here? So we already knew when I was a child that the expanding universe was probably hot when it was young. Uh, and we knew that it had somehow been unstable. 
uh, by reorganizing itself into complex systems. Uh, we knew or guessed that it might be infinite in extent, but we didn't actually know. Uh, we had uh, an estimate of the age of the universe, which was incorrect. But at least we knew there was an age. Uh, we were just getting into the idea of DNA. And um, now I think we can say it's much more complex than we ever could have imagined then. Because now not only do we know that there's a double helix, but that the, uh, the digital code that's in that double helix has been written by billions of years of amateur programmers programming by, at random. And so um, this is the uh, literal example of spaghetti code. So um, it is going to be very long term before we really appreciate what it does and all of the branch points in that spaghetti code. At any rate, um, it, the digital code of our cells enables the unlimited complexity of life. And so here we are uh, trying to un understand it all and just beginning to appreciate the astonishing complexity. <clears throat> we have learned also about uh, why we can have an identity. Uh, in other words, those same individual cells have what biologists call homeostasis, which is uh, vast number of feedback loops that uh, maintain the cell's functions. And even when the cell dies, it is replaced by something similar. So that I'm still here with a name, uh, with my memory, even though most of my atoms have been replaced many times. Pretty interesting. And uh, I think we are never going to fully appreciate the subtleties of it. At any rate, uh, I think astronomers like to work on the, what I now call the easy part, uh, which is um, how did this, the uh, physical part happen? So physicists have, of course, worked out that uh, uh, we're all made of uh, neutrons, protons, and electrons. And uh, the neutron, neutrons and protons themselves are made out of little, littler pieces. Um, and that they are all more or less not quite point-like, but they have uh, a description that's covered by quantum mechanics, which says, we called it a particle, but it actually behaves a lot like a wave. And if you have a wave, it behaves a lot like a particle. And the upshot is that the quantum mechanics tells us the shapes of all the combinations of these particles. The atoms into molecules, molecules into big molecules. Um, even the shape of a DNA or protein molecule is governed by quantum mechanics. And uh, sometimes you can figure something out from theory, but most usually it's better to go measure. At any rate, we also know um, gravity, um, which is described by Einstein's relativity, uh, tells us uh, very basic things like uh, what happens when um, a gas cloud is out there pulling itself together to make a star. So um, astronomers now talk about gravity as giving material negative specific heat. So in school, you never hear about negative specific heat because it sounds like something's going to spontaneously heat up. Well, of course, in astronomy, it does. Uh, the universe has heated itself uh, time and time again uh, from the uh, beginning of the formation of the first objects. In school, we learn about equilibrium thermodynamics, and we know how to calculate the uh, chemical balance equations. Um, but in actuality, uh, the hard problem is the real problem, which is nothing is ever in equilibrium. And uh, how are we going to think about that? So this is a wonderful challenge, and it means that we are not ever going to come to the end of science. One of the curious observations is that nature has found numerous ways to increase entropy by organizing itself into heat engines. So you and I are, are heat engines whose job it is to increase entropy while uh, doing whatever it is that we like to do. So um, jumping back to very elementary things, I think everyone knows that as you look back in time um, by looking at things far away, because light has a speed that is well known. In fact, it's now a defined constant of physics. So when you survey the universe, you can tell how far you're back and you're looking in time by looking to survey the distance that you're looking. So we have in astronomy two basic methods, the surveying that you would learn in school and the standard candle method, which is pretty obvious too if you see two identical things and one is fainter than the other, you say it's probably because it's farther away. So we now can survey the entire universe uh, and determine the distances of things this way. Uh, so now, okay, we can also now measure the velocities of distant objects coming toward us or away from us. 
Uh, and this is also well known. Uh, it's been known since the 19th century. Uh, if you spread out sunlight or a, a light from a bulb, uh, you get a nice little rainbow with colors. And if you pass that uh, light through a prism, uh, you'll spread out the light into the colors. And there, if there's something in the middle, like a gaseous material, uh, it'll either can be emitting uh, at a certain wavelength, as you see in the, in the um, fireworks displays on the July the 4th, or you see uh, in the surface of the sun, you see the chemical elements and molecules in the sun absorb at particular wavelengths. So those are given constants of nature because of the quantum mechanics. Now we say we look at another star. Well, maybe all the wavelengths are shifted over by some factor. They're all multiplied by some number. We can interpret this as saying, well, the object is coming toward us or going away from us with a speed, which we now can use as a tool to measure that speed. Sounds pretty elementary. Uh, and the basic idea is elementary, but we got a big surprise back in 1929 because Edwin Hubble compiled some data that had been obtained by him and other people. And this uh, graph uh, shows galaxies. Each of those little circles and dots is a galaxy, 100 billion stars or so held together by gravity. Uh, and his distance estimate is on the horizontal direction and the speed of motion away from us on the vertical direction. And you see there's a magnificent trend here, um, except for a few. In the lower left corner, they're all going away from us. And the trend is that the farther away, the faster. If the trend is a perfect trend, you should be able to find how long did it take for this to occur, divide the distance by the speed, and that would get the apparent age of the universe. 1929, the first time we knew the universe had an age, uh, and he got about 2 billion years, which was wrong uh, because his standard candles weren't really standards but it took us a long time to find out that mistake. At any rate, uh, some very great drama here. This tells us about the expanding universe. It tells us a few galaxies are headed in our direction in a few billion years they're going to get here and there will be a wonderful collision. Um, and so suddenly we knew big things. And so it was front page news even in the year of economic collapse. We call it the Hubble Lemaitre law now because George Lemaitre was a theoretical physicist uh, with a PhD from MIT. And he had applied Einstein's equations to predict that this must be true. Einstein said that was ridiculous, um, but eventually he had to agree. Uh, Lemaitre, by the way, was also a Belgian Catholic priest. He got to meet the Pope and the, and the Pope said, well, doesn't this story uh, agree with uh, what's in the Bible? And uh, George Lemaitre said, well, I'm a scholar. Uh, you can't use it for that. So what do we do next? Well, uh, in the 1940s, uh, we learned nuclear physics. In the 1948, it was predicted that the early universe <clears throat> had heat that should still be available to observe. 1965, it was detected uh, more or less by accident. Uh, people were not looking for it at the time. Other people were. Anyway, uh, Penzias and Wilson received their Nobel Prize for discovering the cosmic microwave background radiation. It's the leftover heat of the early universe. Uh, so it has now a temperature of about 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. So in 1970, I was a uh, grad student at Berkeley looking for a thesis project. And I found Paul Richards and Charles Towns and Mike Werner. They were going to measure this this cosmic heat. I said, I'd like to do that. So we tried. And eventually, uh, as I think I mentioned, the, uh, the second experiment was unsuccessful. Uh, it worked the second time when my graduate student buddy, David Woody, fixed it. Anyway, um, this led to the idea that we should do this in outer space. And here is the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, or COBE. Uh, it went up, and it did work, because real engineers made it work. And what we did was we measured the color of this, the heat of the early universe. In other words, we compared it with a prediction, and it matches the prediction within 50 parts per million. Number one confirmation of the expanding universe story, which we call the Big Bang. Uh, we also discovered for the first time, although there had been hints, uh, that the uh, whole sky is covered with hot and cold spots in this cosmic heat. 
And uh, Stephen Hawking saw that map and he said that was the most important scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. So why was that so important? Well, number one, um, we wouldn't be here if those spots were not there. As far as we can tell, um, something had to make spots where there was a little extra density so that gravity acting on those dense regions could stop the expansion of the material, pull it back in, make galaxies, stars, planets, and people. So we're here because of those spots. Uh, number two, most of those spots come from cosmic dark matter, which nobody can see, but we can measure the effects. And number three, if we ever know what made the spots, some kind of quantum mechanics of the early universe, then we ought to be able to predict how many they were and how bright they were. And that's a, a puzzle for the future. At any rate, uh, after it had been confirmed uh, by the next NASA satellite mission, we, we saw that we got the right answer the first time. By 2006, the Nobel Committee was able to say, yeah, give them the, a prize. So uh, we shared the prize uh, with um, George Smoot, also from Berkeley. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> after that, um, um, satellite flew in 1995. I'm thinking, what else am I going to do? And uh, I got a call from NASA headquarters. Would I like to work on this new telescope that I'm telling you about today? But before I do that, I want to show you a summary of this. I took my chart to Stockholm. I showed it many times. And there's a king giving my, my prize. They throw quite a party for Nobelists. It lasts about 10 days. And uh, parties and speeches every day. At any rate, um, I knew from that point my, my life would be different, but I've chosen to basically make it as much like it was before and to keep on working on the Webb telescope. So here's now the story of the expanding universe. Um, we start with something that's imaginary. Uh, we have no way to observe it today. Alan Guth cooked this up to explain what we knew. And I thought we'll never be able to test this theory. But the idea is something happened very early on, uh, which was unstable and uh, gave it a quantum mechanical story. And this unstable thing produced all the particles that we have today. The universe is expanding into itself. There is no first moment. There is not a moment of creation. <coughs> this is not a big firecracker. This is an infinite universe expanding into itself. So um, when people didn't like the idea of the Big Bang, um, as some people don't, I think they didn't really understand what we were saying anyway. So how are we going to know whether we got the story right? Well, uh, supercomputer people um, can make a... Um, Simulation. If we start with the initial conditions of the universe, we should be able to make a movie of the story I just told you. How gravity stops the expansion of the universe in places and pulls the material back together to make galaxies that will then start to bump into each other and make uh, huge structures in space. So they are making a box of uh, primordial material, letting the clock run and see what it does. So it makes galaxies, and eventually it makes them into flat sheets and filaments uh, cutting through space. And once in a while, the rotating box shows you the thing edge on like this. So then after a few billion years, the simulation starts to show us explosions. <coughs> this is uh, still a small explosions compared to the expanding universe, but we're seeing um, two things that happen in the cores of galaxies. One is when stars get old, they blow up, or they can. And two is a black hole can form in the middle of a galaxy. When material falls into the black hole, it gets extremely hot and um, energy is released. <coughs> Excuse me. So this thing runs along for many billions of years. At about 9 billion years of history, the um, solar system is being born in its own little galaxy our Milky Way galaxy would be one of these little bits that's being shown in the simulated picture here. And by more or less coincidence, I suppose, the explosions begin to slow down in the cores of galaxies. And that's handy because they would be powerful enough to prevent life from occurring on little planets that were anywhere near them. Anyway, this is a beautiful movie. 
And you have to ask, how do I know if the conclusion is right? Does this movie re match reality? So what we're going to do, we're going to take pictures, synthetic pictures from the movie uh, and say, well, um, if I had a telescope and I was looking at a, the universe that you just described, what would it look like with a Hubble telescope or the Webb telescope? Let's compare. So we're in that business right now. I was trying to work out whether these kinds of simulations are right. So here is the great Hubble telescope. Uh, it is already 31 and a half years old. Um, it was launched in um, April of 1990, just a few months after the COBE satellite. So uh, just this week, it was announced that it has now up and running completely again. It had some glitches in the electronics and which were overcome by switching to redundant uh, methods of doing things. So that's the only way you can make a long life piece of hardware electronics in space because you can't always go up and put new parts in. In a way, it is working beautifully. It has been serviced altogether five times by astronauts. So it's very much more powerful than the ever was dreamed to be when it was imagined at the beginning. Anyway, if we have taken pictures of things. Here is a, a nearby nebula called the Whirlpool Nebula. Um, and you can see this giant spiral galaxy. If the solar system were in this galaxy, we would be on the outer reaches. Uh, but uh, our galaxy is not exactly like this one. Um, this galaxy you can see has a neighbor and they're close together and they are about to have a giant collision become completely scrambled. That will happen to us too. Our galaxy will be completely scrambled in a few billion years when it emerges with the Andromeda Nebula. Uh, we won't be here, um, but the solar system will still be here. On the other hand, in about a billion years, the sun will be too hot for life here on Earth. So the Hubble telescope discovered there's a black hole in the middle of this particular galaxy uh, and uh, the multicolored picture there shows you that stars are coming toward us very quickly on one side of the middle and going away from us very quickly on the other side. So with Newton's laws, you can calculate the mass of the object in the middle that's making them whirl around. And it's much, much bigger than the mass of any possible star. So we say it's a black hole in there. Now we know every galaxy has one. Uh, maybe some galaxies have many. Uh, but they seem somehow to get all to fall down into the middle of the galaxy. This one is the Crab Nebula, uh, which is barely possible to see with your own small telescope. Uh, this is an example of a star that blew up. Uh, we know the exact date because it was observed by astronomers worldwide, and we have records. Uh, this <coughs> star blew up and it left a neutron star behind in the middle. You can't see it in the picture, plus debris flying out. This is important for our story because stars that did this liberated most of the chemical elements of life uh, to be uh, turned into star stuff, to be recycled into future generations of stars and planets like ours. Now we have a new addition to this story. Um, sometimes uh, neutron stars like the one that's in there come in pairs. And when they can come in pairs, sometimes they can merge eventually with each other. And the gigantic explosion that comes from that liberates the very heavy chemical elements, such as the gold that's in my ring, uh, or the gold that's covering the mirrors on the Webb telescope. So we couldn't uh, be able to do what we do without stars that blow up like that. So here's the Webb telescope itself. I'll tell you a little bit about its story. Um, it is. Uh, as I mentioned, gigantic telescope is much bigger than the rocket, has to unfold in outer space. Um, there are four instruments on board uh, that basically take pictures and obtain spectra. A spectrum tells you what's in something, how it's moving, how hot it is, what the pressure is. And so a uh, spectrum to an astronomer is worth a thousand pictures. A picture being a thousand words, that's an awful lot of words that one spectrum is worth. Uh, we are going up on the European supplied Ariane 5 rocket two weeks from today, according to plan. And we are carrying fuel to last at least five years. Uh, maybe uh, if we're fortunate with the process of the, the launch, even as much as 20 years might be possible. 
We will see when we get there. It's an international project and the Europe and Canada have both chipped in big chunks of their budgets to make this a possibility. So um, what are the things we are going to look at? Well, everything uh, that you can see. Uh, everything that you can see that emits light in the wavelength range that we can pick up, which is just about everything. In the upper left corner, the graphic is telling you the story of the expanding universe and that there was a period of time called the Dark Ages. Um, after the universe became transparent and the heat radiation became visible to us, but before any stars and galaxies lit up. So we're going to be looking back into that time, rewatching the galaxies grow uh, as they, they crash into each other, as gaseous material falls in. We'll be looking at uh, stars being born nearby in clouds like this beautiful one in the lower left. It's called the Eagle Nebula. And we will be looking for planets around other stars in this picture, there's just a little white dot in the upper right corner that says uh, I'm a planet. And all that beautiful blue and gold is actually uh, uh, glare from the star. So that's the hard problem to see those planets, but we'll try. So here's the telescope design. It's a big, para almost parabolic mirror, collects starlight, it focuses it down, bounces it off a small mirror, which uh, reflects it down into the instrument package there's a third mirror inside that makes the Im improves the image quality. And uh, this is capable of doing a, an essentially perfect image for wavelengths longer than about two micrometers, microns. Uh, so that's a huge engineering accomplishment, particularly since the mirror is made of 18 separate beryllium hexagons coated with gold. They all have to be adjusted to the right place after they're launched. And they all have to be polished to the correct shape before we fly them. So since they're going to be cold, that's a pretty interesting engineering challenge. You polish them, you measure them warm, you measure them cold, you see how much distortion there is. Uh, you make a map of all the bumps you have to remove uh, the next time you have it warm, polish off all the bumps, cool them down again, then they're fine. So that's a really tricky challenge and uh, was invented specially for us. We have four instruments on board, uh, cameras and spectrometers covering everything from the red wavelength that you can see with your eye, 0.6 micron, microns, all the way out to more than 28 microns. And um, we will be able to do whatever astronomers basically need. Um, we said we need to build something that does all the science that you haven't even imagined yet, but you would never be able to do from the ground and never be able to do with a Hubble Space Telescope because they're just not big enough or not cold enough, or they're not in outer space. So without giving you details about that, this is just a huge engineering accomplishment to be able to do that. Um, and the sensitivity is truly extraordinary. <clears throat> if you were a bumblebee, a square centimeter uh, hanging out at the distance of the moon from Earth away from the telescope, we could pick you up. We could see you, but it takes a time exposure. <clears throat> it's tricky for us to look at bright objects, but we can. And we can even track moving objects in the solar system, such as the next great interstellar comet like Oumuamua that may come through when we're up there. So we're ready. Uh, we will be able to do what astronomers think we should be able to do soon. <clears throat> if you're an astronomer or in the general public, we have vast numbers of videos that have been made. Um, webinars have been given. You can look us all up. Google is remarkable. It'll find all of this for you. Just to illustrate some of the first things we're going to look at. Uh, we are hunting for the very first galaxies. So this is a picture that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. They spent two weeks looking at one spot in the sky, just waiting for the photons to arrive and counting them. And there's uh, thousands of galaxies and one star in this piece of this image. Uh, what we learned from the Hubble was, uh, thank you, that's a great picture, but it's not a big enough telescope and it does not pick up the infrared that we think comes from the very first galaxies. 
So why are the first galaxies infrared? The expanding universe stretches out the light uh, that starts out as ultraviolet or visible light. By the time it gets to our telescope, it's infrared. So astronomers looked at this picture. They wrote a book and they said, please build us a new telescope that's capable of seeing the very first galaxies, the little infrared specks, the tiny dots that are not here that we need to see to really understand the story of the first ones. Well, why do we care about the first ones? Well, because it's part of the story, but also in, they are very sensitive to questions about fundamental physics, uh, dark matter, dark energy, and is there anything fishy going on with the story of the early universe? <clears throat> so that's interesting. Also, the first stars and galaxies must have been made of pure hydrogen and helium because there wasn't anything else from the Big Bang. So it should be all different. The prediction is the first galaxies and stars would be very massive. The stars would burn out in a few million years, and then they would blow up. So what is that all going to look like when we finally see it? It's hard to tell. Anyway, we'll look. We will be looking in places like this. Uh, this is where uh, we see that the longer the wavelength of infrared, the better you can see around dust. This is that great uh, pillars of creation again, the equal nebula. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the visible light picture, the glowing cloud of gas lit up by the new stars. And you see that the dust clouds are opaque. On the right-hand side, uh, we use the near-infrared capability of Hubble to say, uh, by the way, now you can begin to see through the dust cloud. Why, why do we care about this one? Because we believe stars are being born right inside at this moment, and we would like to see it happen. So the longer the wavelength of infrared, the better we can see inside. <coughs> We will, here's another picture just to show you how a, the beauty of the picture changes as we go from visible light to infrared. <clears throat> we will be looking at in the solar system. These are exciting to me because these are both places where we could look, learn something about the origin of life. <clears throat> Europa on the left is a satellite of Jupiter that was discovered by Galileo in 1610, I believe. Uh, we know from the visit that the Galileo mission made that this satellite of Jupiter has an ocean covered with ice. From recently, we discovered that water is spitting out between the cracks in the ice blocks. So we have now planned a mission to go fly through those plumes of water to see if they have organic molecules in them. And that would be really, really exciting because what if that ocean under the ice is alive this would tell, perhaps tell us. <clears throat> On the right-hand side, we have a map, a geological map of the surface of Titan. Titan is satellite of Saturn, which is so big and so cold that it has an atmosphere that's enough to fly a helicopter. So we're going to do that. So um, Webb Telescope will be looking at the chemical composition of the surface of this satellite to help us understand what are the most interesting places to look when we land there with our next mission. Saiten is an interesting to me because it's an alternate source uh, place where life might possibly exist. If uh, I get the question, are you sure that life has to be like the ones that we have here based on water as a solvent and, and hydro and um, carbon molecules? Well, the answer is, well, I don't know, but this is a place where nature has done a lot of experiments. It's cold. But there is a liquid hydrocarbon solvent there. If it's logically possible for a hydrocarbon solvent with impurities of water to be doing the job, there it is. We might find something eventually. So how about planets? Is there life elsewhere in the universe? Well, probably yes. General answer of most astronomers give is yes. Um, but so now it's a question of where are the neighbors? How far away do you have to look before you see something sort of like Earth that might be alive? So um, we have two ways to look for planets. So one is just taking images, and that's really hard because the, the uh, planets that we're looking at are uh, extremely faint compared to their stars. The sun is 10 billion times brighter than the Earth, for instance. We have another method, which is a little easier, 
Now, once in a while, we find a planet that goes in front of its star, blocks some starlight, and you say, well, okay, well, something has happened. I can now tell the size of the planet from how much of the starlight was being blocked. Uh, if we're lucky, we have a chance to analyze the starlight that went through the atmosphere of the planet on its way to our telescope, and we can tell the difference with a spectrometer because a planetary atmosphere will ha may have molecules that absorb specially at some wavelengths and not at others. This helps you tell the difference between the atmospheric signal and the, and the rock underneath. So we have a large number of these already cataloged. We know when the events will occur. Um, but the ones that we have the ability to study well are different. Uh, here we're showing that um, we're observing uh, planets around M stars. M stars are, <coughs> are a cool version of the sun. They're about the size of the planet Jupiter and about half the temperature of the sun. So that means that the uh, little planets are a lot closer in um, and also uh, that they're subject to being blasted away by solar storms or the storm, storms on those stars, which might possibly rip the entire atmosphere off of a planet. So our first big question is, well, do those planets have atmospheres at all? And if they do, um, is there any sign of being at all like Earth? Uh, for instance, do they have oceans enough to support an atmospheric water vapor? Uh, could we see water vapor signs in those planets? Yes, the answer is yes, we probably can, and we'll certainly look. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll be doing that. So just a little bit of story about how do we get there? How do we build a telescope and get it all the way into space? First, we build the telescope in our clean room at Goddard Space Flight Center, just outside Washington, D.C., and uh, it's big and beautiful and gold and it's very clean uh, because we put it together very carefully. Then we uh, put a tent over it and we take it around to the shaker. We have to simulate being launched on top of a rocket with many G's of vibration and we have to make sure it's not going to break. So we tested it there. Um, we didn't break it. We learned how it vibrates and we said, okay, we're good to go. We send it through a big shipping container, put it on an airplane, and flew it all the way down to Texas. This is the C-5C, largest aircraft of uh, the military. We got it out and put the telescope into the vacuum tank at Johnson Space Center. This is the very same one the Apollo astronauts used to walk down the ladder uh, onto the surface of the moon when they were practicing. So we passed learned how it would be when it was cold and in outer space. Hi, John. Put it back uh, on your I'm sorry yeah, to interrupt. Um, uh, just uh, wanted to let you know that uh, we're, we're running a little tight on time. We'd love to have some time for questions. Um, so um, if you can, uh, maybe um, if you can uh, uh, finish the story okay. within a few uh, five minutes or so, that's fine. Excellent. Thanks for yeah, the thank reminder. You. We'll do that. Uh, OK, this there's the airplane. We took it to California. We stuck it together with the warm part of the observatory. Uh, we folded it and unfolded it. Now we put it on a ship, sent it to French Guiana through the uh, Panama Canal, took it out again, and it is now uh, gassed up. There's fuel in its tanks, and we're about to put it on top of the rocket. So in two weeks, we push the button, it goes straight out to outer space, and then it will begin observing in six months. It takes six months to get it all cooled down, set up, focused, and ready to go. And so uh, we have, on the other hand, an hour-by-hour -hour plan for the next six months. So expect uh, great things from us in summer of 2022. We're going to put it far away. Uh, we can skip over that. Um, this is a scary movie. This is what it takes to unfold it in space. Unfold it very carefully. It's obviously complex. And if it could have been simpler, it would have been. Um, how are you going to make sure it works? We will have it, uh, well, we have 
multiple multiple ways to accomplish each thing. We have redundancy, electronic redundancy. And we have been practicing and rehearsing and getting review committees to tell us when they think they're worried about something. So that's what it takes to make this incredibly complex operation work. Uh, practice, rehearse, keep track of all the possible things that could go wrong. Manage the risks very carefully because humans are terrible at risk management and be sure about every single thing. So the thing that did not work on my thesis project was that we did not test enough. And we knew that. We thought we, the next test is enough. And then, and of course, we learned something. Um, here in the case of the Webb telescope, we don't have a chance to learn after launch. We have to get it right. So there it is in, in its great golden glory in outer space. So wish us luck. Um, this is the scary thing that happens in the first two weeks. So let's uh, stop and have questions. Thanks so much, John. That was absolutely fascinating. And uh, also, um, you know, extremely exciting. And um, I I'm sure that uh, um, uh, you and your team are uh, extremely anxious to, to see it up there and, and unfold and, and start delivering the data. Um, so we have about um, uh, seven or eight questions right now. So I guess um, I'll, I'll just um, um, uh, read them off to you and, and uh, really excited to, to hear your responses. Um, so the first question we have is from Andrew Thiel. He's a Hertz Fellow um, and advisor. Uh, his question is, what is the first thing that the telescope will look at when it's first turned on? Uh, well, we haven't actually announced that. Uh, of course, what we first have to do is focus it. So it's going to be some bright enough star so you can tell if you get a good image. And we will also focus on a, uh, a cluster of stars where we know where all the stars are very precisely to make sure that you're getting a nice, sharp, undistorted image. And then uh, we'll surprise you. Ray Chen uh, from UT Austin asks, with all data collected, is there anything that violates our original understanding of the universe? Oh my goodness. Or expected, um, I suppose. Yeah, so there's always something on the edge of discovery. So right now, astronomers are working on some great mysteries. Basic physics, uh, we've got the dark matter and the dark energy that astronomers deduce and cannot see. Uh, we've got uh, multiple ways of measuring the rate of expansion of the universe, and they don't quite agree. We think those are important. So something mysterious is there. Um, we've got Alan Guth's idea about the cosmic inflation. Well, who asked for that? Well, Alan thought it up. Um, it seems to be right, uh, but what if it's not? Um, there are lots of other pictures of how this all is supposed to work. Uh, since uh, the dark matter and the dark energy were not predicted by pretty much anybody, um, we don't have a place in physics that calls for them to be required. So um, there's plenty of mystery here. And closer up, the mystery of how do complicated things work, like planetary systems, uh, how do stars get born, all that is uh, incredibly complex. So surprises are expected. That's great. Um, is there a, a particular measurement that uh, will, for example, support um, or uh, uh, cancel out theories of, of dark matter? in particular? Oh, goodness. Uh, a lot of people are thinking about that. Um, I know uh, the teams that measured and discovered the accelerating universe, what we call the dark energy, they're going to go again and use this better equipment. Um, so everybody's got an idea. But dark matter is not the, uh, the primary purpose of this observatory. That is the primary purpose of this, the uh, Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which is uh, coming in about four or five more years. It's a smaller telescope, but takes a much bigger bite of the sky and is specially designed to measure evidence of the dark matter and the dark energy. 
Robert Reed from Vanderbilt asks, the engineering life cycle of JWST extended over many years. Please briefly describe the two or three most interesting and or challenging engineering accomplishments that allowed uh, the James Webb telescope to move from the early years. Oh my goodness. Well, I think some pretty big obvious ones. Number one, you have to be able to build a big telescope out of smaller pieces. So um, we ran uh, competitions um, and various industry bids came in saying, well, I can do this. And we said, okay, here's some money, prove it to us that you can do that. We didn't finish that until 2002. Um, we had to uh, get the world's best, most perfect infrared detectors. And we had, and we thought we had them. And then they started going bad just sitting on the shelf. So we had to have another go at that one. Uh, but they are astonishingly good. Um, we had to learn how to focus the telescope after launch because it's made out of 18 pieces. And so that was a big mathematical project that grew out of the repair for the Hubble. So those are all great challenges. And, uh, but there were altogether 10 inventions we had to make before we could finish designing. Yeah, in my field um, of microscopy, we benefited directly from adaptive op optics and it uh, generated an entire revolution in uh, our ability to see things smaller. It gave us a factor of 10 in sensitivity just from that work. So I would love to see more from, from Webb as well, uh, trickle down to us as, as well. Um, uh, next question is from Josh Wynn, who's Hertz Fellow from Princeton. His question is, why wasn't the mission designed for a longer lifetime? So that would be uh, 10 to 20 years instead of five to 10. Ah, well, we actually have designed it with nothing that's supposed to wear out. So um, we are, the lifetime is limited by the fuel tank. Uh, but when you uh, have a space mission, you're going to have to make a promise and there's no way you can promise something that lasts 10 or 20 years, unless you're gonna test things for 10 or 20 years, which we don't wanna do. So um, you can have a pretty good argument that a, a thing that you design will last for five years, but you, if you have to promise that it will last a lot much longer, you can't do it the same way. So we promise five and design for much longer. Great, and it, I heard that uh, earlier, you mentioned that there are plans to service it. So I think that uh, possibly is in, in the uh, well, in the cards not really uh, we it's not impossible to service uh, we know what we would do if we have to service it uh, but we did not design it to be in easy mm -hmm. and we don't currently have any equipment that could go there the next question is from ray o'neill from florida a m his question is what is the plan or schedule for data dissemination or access to the extra NASA community? Oh, okay. Well, it's pretty much the same as it is for Hubble. All the data come out uh, through the Space Telescope Science Institute archives. And so they will all be there. Uh, most of the data come out one year after they're taken because the uh, astronomers who proposed uh, to get those particular observations, want to write the data up themselves and get their professional papers. Uh, the early release science program that we defined, uh, those data will come out immediately. So a uh, combination of two, but anyway, will all become available um, because that's the right thing to do. So, um, yeah. Lynn Seppala. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, Hertz Fellow, um, who's a former LLNL optical engineer asks, if everything started at the Big Bang and our universe eventually ends, uh, what happened before and what will happen then? Oh, goodness. Well, those are uh, obviously questions I can't really answer. Um, we don't know uh, what the meaning of before the Big Bang really is. Um, so basically the question is, is the universe um, have a prior phase before the expansion of the began? And the answer is, well, big maybe. Uh, we don't have a good way to think about it. If you imagine running the universe backwards in time, you get to everything is squeezed together so tightly 
uh, that the temperatures and pressures exceed anything we can possibly calculate. And then you have to say, well, then in that case, I guess X, Y, Z uh, is the laws of nature that apply. And maybe you have a way of escaping um, that, and maybe you don't. Um, Alan Guth gave us this story about inflation. So in his story, uh, we can't get past uh, the before that. Uh, uh, but that's not the only story. So uh, many people worked on the bouncing universe idea. And uh, how, can, how could I tell you that's not true? I, there's not very much evidence against it either. Is that so, the brain theory, yeah, is it? Yeah, the, the bouncing universe. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there are versions uh, where many universes are being created. Um, uh, one idea is that uh, what we think of as a, a universe is actually uh, a surface in a higher dimensional space. And uh, when uh, surfaces in higher dimensional space come near to each other, they do something interesting, like make another universe. So um, that's beyond my capability to explain, but it's not logically impossible. So stay tuned. Maybe that'll be your next telescope, <laughs> which could make those measurements. <laughs> All right, question from Mike McCracken. Uh, Hertz Fellow, uh, who's also a retired uh, chief scientist with the Climate Institute. He asked, you said that in a billion years or so, the sun would be too hot for life to exist on Earth. Is this assuming the same albedo for Earth as now? Might it be that Earth's albedo could be increased enough to allow life on Earth to survive? Or might, for example, UV or other radiation be strong that protecting Earth uh, would be totally impractical? Um, oh. and and then might other planets further from the sun evolve in a way that we could jump jump to the next rock, basically? Yeah. Well, a good hard question. I don't know. Um, but um, when we get closer to the end, what actually happens is the sun expands. And I misspoke a little bit. It expands. It gets brighter. But it also cools off a bit on the surface. So it will be cooler, but brighter because it'll be bigger. So eventually, um, it will expand so that the Earth is near the surface uh, of that expanded star. So at that point, there's no escape. But that's more like 5 billion years from now. So there probably is a time when you could move farther out in the solar system and stay alive. It will become quite imperative that we figure out a way of, of jumping the rocks, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, next question is from Lali Peru. Um, her question is, will this reduce the amount of time for us to see what is happening, new stars born, et cetera? Um, what, what this is, is she referring to is that? Um, I might uh, interpret this as saying, um, will we be able to see very rapidly, um, you know, a catalog of stars being born quickly. Maybe this is more along the lines of, uh, you know, are we are we focusing on a, a large swath of data simultaneously, or uh, you know, where we're seeing a evolution, or are we pinpoint viewing uh, with this device? Okay, we will be looking at specific objects um, that are chosen because they look like they're interesting and they will tell us something specific. So this is not a great tool for surveying a large part of the sky. So the way we do it is somebody says, I have reason to think that's the most important place to look. They send us a proposal and we say, oh yeah, let's do that. So um, other equipment is much better for a wide scale survey. The Nancy Grace Roman telescope, the Vera Rubin telescope, um, the U European Euclid mission, they're all survey telescopes that will help us say, uh, Please look over here. Let's follow this up. That's great. You, you guys have a telescope for everyone uh, for different applications. Um, although this is this is the uh, the flagship telescope, right? That uh, will will answer the biggest questions potentially. Michael Floyd, Hertz Fellow, asks: um, the JWST can't be serviced at L2, right? So that's related to the previous discussion. Um, so what happens if it runs out uh, or breaks, um, runs out of fuel or breaks? Um, do, we, do we just send out another one? Uh, or uh, you know, do we send out a rescue mission like we did with Hubble so urgently and successfully? 
Well, goodness, uh, if it uh, lasts for 20 years, we'll probably say it's time for the next telescope now. Um, please build us that one. Um, if it happened much sooner and we were feeling very resourceful and ingenious, we might figure a way to, to service the Webb telescope. We didn't uh, make it easy. Um, there's not a label that says no user serviceable parts inside, but it's almost like that. Um, it was not made to be taken apart. So the only thing that's sort of plausible to do at the moment is put in more fuel. Yeah. Yeah, I understand very, uh, um, uh, very clearly the, the trade-off between getting it up there versus making it a uh, singing, all singing, all dancing type, type of device. And, um, you know, the big trade-offs from cost as well as time frame. Um, next question is from John Ziskin, Hertz Fellow. Um, what is the risk of damage from radiation or macroscopic bodies moving through space and how is it mitigated? <clears throat> okay. At L2. <clears throat> Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, L2 is uh, not particularly special about those things. So it's just like a random interplanetary space point. So we get blasted by three things. Uh, one is um, cosmic rays from the sun, um, plasma from the sun. So uh, the sun sets off storms from time to time and uh, they can harm things. So we know what that is and we design for it. Um, all the same, uh, if the sun is having a storm, we're not gonna launch that day because we just don't wanna take that extra chance. <clears throat> Number two, there um, are galactic cosmic rays that you cannot shield out no matter what you do. And so um, we designed to uh, withstand all of those. There are not very many of them, but they're, they're very persistent. And the third thing is the little particles. So there are interplanetary dust grains that are left over from comets, and they will be whacking away at our telescope quite often. But most of them are very small, and so we don't think we're going to care. A typical dust grain is about a thousandth of an inch across, so it'll make a little tiny pit in the mirror, and that's about it. Mm. So there, are, there aren't any, uh, what do they call them, wiffle plates or something the, that they use for protecting the, the space vehicle? Uh, the, the ones no, we that have, we do have covers over things that matter. Uh, mm. We don't have any cables that are right on the surface that could be uh, cut by a, one of those sand grains. Mm. Great. Receivable. Okay. Uh, well, related to um, to longevity and service, um, Carlos Sequin asks, uh, "What type of fuel does JWST need?" Ah, uh, we have two. <clears throat> One is a uh, hydrazine, N2H2, uh, which is a, uh, a lovely thing. It uh, spontaneously will break down into nitrogen and ammonia as, and, uh, and hydrogen. And uh, so it's a fuel all by itself. If you want a little more oomph, then you also let it react with uh, nitrogen tetroxide. So uh, it's called a bipropellant system. So we've got both ways to do it. All right, next question from David Turetsky, Hertz Fellow. Isn't the radiation that moons like Europa and Titan receive from their gas giant planets so strong that it would interfere with the possibility of life? Humans couldn't walk on Europa in an ordinary spacesuit, right? Um, <clears throat> absolutely right about life on the surface for Europa. It's nasty there. It's hard to even build an electronic body uh, box that will survive with thick shielding on it. On the other hand, um, life underneath that, on that surface uh, of ice could be completely protected. So it's a question of location. Titan has got a thick atmosphere, and so it probably has a well-protected surface, even though the top of that atmosphere might be bombarded by cosmic rays from its neighborhood. Yeah, it hadn't occurred to me that a thick enough ice sheet could actually protect against radiation. That's an interesting question of uh, what that might look like practically. Um, Mike McCracken asks uh, another question. Um, his question is, the Hubble has benefited from being within the orbit of the space shuttle, so astronauts could get there to fix it. 
For the new satellite, it is well beyond that altitude, so that would seem to require a real level of perfection and backup redundant capabilities and a resilience to any space debris. So we discussed space debris already. Um, but what special testing was done to give assurance that early failure won't occur? Oh, goodness. Uh, well, we do the same sort of thing we always have to do, which is to turn everything on and make it run for a while. Um, so we actually did have an early failure. And we had to go fix the uh, telemetry box, or sorry, the uh, transceiver box. <clears throat> and we have two of them, and they both failed uh, very late in the program. So we were very glad that we tested them, because uh, they're very ordinary boxes. And they should have lasted forever, but they didn't. <clears throat> the other uh, method that we have is we have redundancy for everything that we could. So every motor has two sets of electrical windings and two electronic boxes to control it. Um, so that's the basic thing you do to deal with random part failures. I mean, there's enough parts that you have to do that. And that's why the Hubble is still running also. Yeah, I remember uh, Hubble was based on a, a military satellite platform, right? And that was why the space shuttle was made the way it was, so that it could uh, transfer such large payloads. So, um, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, in part. <laughs> right. Um, okay, next question is from Dave Turetsky. So I think we have a couple more and then maybe we'll open it up to, uh, to live questions. So um, I'll go through these two and then, and then we'll, we'll trans transition. Um, Dave Turetsky, Hearst Fellow, uh, asked, um, uh, actually, no, we already asked this one. Um, this one is from Greg Magel, also Hertz Fellow. So he was asking, uh, regarding fuel, what's the energy source supplying electrical power? And that piques my interest as well because we're on the dark side. Uh, from the sun, right? Okay. And we are always there. Yeah, we use solar power and we avoid this shadow of the earth. So although uh, the Lagrange point L2 really is right around the end of the umbra of earth, uh, we just don't go there. We make sure we never go through there and we make sure we never even go through the shadow of the moon. Mm. So what is the power requirement then overall for the, for the whole device? What's well, the power budget? Uh, it's about two kilowatts, I think, is the number. Two kilowatts. It's not very much, considering how big the observatory is, but most of it, it's just um, a big sunshade. Mm -hmm. it doesn't need power. Yeah, it's it's meant to meant to be an umbrella. Um, <laughs> reflect the power away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, last question here from John Gersh from the um, forum is uh, he's a Hertz fellow as well. He asks, what constraints do the shielding requirements place on pointing the telescope? Uh, it's directly related to the sunshade. Uh, over the course of a year, will it be able to look in any direction? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the uh, sunshade is designed to protect the telescope uh, when we are looking at angles away from the sun, <coughs> a certain range. So we can get as close as 85 degrees from the sun and as far as 135 degrees from the sun. So that picks up about 35% uh, of the sky on any particular day is available to us. Then you have to wait uh, some number of months for the rest of it to come in. So over the course of six months, the entire sky is even more or less evenly. There are two little circles, one around the North uh, Pole and one around the South Pole uh, of the ecliptic. And those little circles are available uh, every day of the year. Fantastic. Um, so, so John, we've we've kept you uh, over for for quite a while. Can you take more questions at the moment? Um, and if so, um, uh, we we might open it up to to live questions. Yeah, let's take maybe uh, ten minutes more. I can do. Okay, fantastic. If Thank you, like. you so much. <laughs> All right. These um, are great questions too, by the way. Everybody yeah, they are. Asking something that's of interest and, uh, and pretty, pretty challenging. Yeah. So thanks, thanks very much to the audience for for their engagement as well. Um, all right. So um, I, okay. I suppose. Oh, Can I uh, um, ask a question? Um, so first of all, uh, this is David Gallus, John. Um, oh, hi, David. 
Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for a terrific talk and question answering. I think this has been great. So my question is, are there specific plans for coordinated use of the various available telescopes for um, observation, coordinated observations and, at, uh, and uh, observational projects? Um, answer is uh, there probably will be. Right now, um, there's no particular requirement for simultaneous observation or concurrent observation of any targets. But a lot of people say, um, I saw my wonderful thing with telescope X. I need to follow it up with telescopes YZ. Um, this is a, um, a new area of astronomy called multi-messenger astronomy. So when something happens that's not expected, uh, suddenly the wires light up and everybody has to point the telescope over there. So that's how part of it is done. Um, most things that we see in astronomy do not change very quickly, uh, but a few of them do. So those are the ones where closer coordination is required. We have a question from Ray O'Neill, who asked a question earlier. Any possibility of using JWST to look for Lorentz invariance, which is energy correlation in photon arrival times photometry, as was proposed with the Fermi telescope? Hmm. Um, I don't know that it's impossible, but I haven't heard anybody proposing it. Now, just a comment here. Um, if uh, if uh, anyone's interested, um, you can also raise your hand um, as a function on the bottom of the screen um, uh, if you want to ask a question. Uh, okay, next question is from Michel Floyd from um, uh, also Hertz Fellow. Uh, his second question is, how dark is L2? Um, you know, in, in the unshadowed region and, and then also in Umbra. Okay, um, so uh, in a quite part of the question is, well, how dark is the sky? So how dark is the sky is pretty much set by Two things, how bright are the stars out there? And they're more or less randomly located and there are glowing clouds out there. Then there is also the interplanetary dust cloud that we live inside. So um, if you have good eyes and you can get out to a really dark place um, in the mountains at sunset, uh, you will see a, a conical zone of bright light sticking up diagonally near where the sun went down. That's called the interplanetary dust. <clears throat> so that's uh, always there, and it's like um, pretty bright. It limits how sensitive the telescope can be, because photons come in randomly from that dust cloud, and uh, the sky is glowing. So our detectors are so good that that matters. So uh, another part of your question is, well, if you put up an umbrella, how cold do you get behind the umbrella? And uh, it turns out to not only, it's not only influenced by the, um, <clears throat> the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is a temperature of 2.7. It's also in, in, influenced by the starlight, which, uh, and by the interplanetary dust cloud. So if you made a really, really good umbrella and put up a thermometer, it would come to a, come to a temperature of about five or seven degrees Kelvin which is not all that cold after all. So that's a root, that's a root mean square between? Yeah, yeah. We live between near all the sources. sun and we live in our own galaxy. So there's stars and, wow. stars and what, things out there. What is the ratio between the CMB that you're looking for, uh, let's say, uh, versus the uh, interplanetary uh, dust cloud that uh, well, is the noise the source? System, here in the solar system where we live, the uh, interplanetary dust is actually brighter. <clears throat> than the CMB, but it radiators, radiates at a different wavelength. 
Mm, right, so you can filter it. If you, if you were outside the galaxy, the uh, CMB is by far the dominant term. Mm -hmm. the, most of the uh, radiant energy in the universe is left over from the Big Bang. It just was hard for us to measure the first time. Craig Keller asks, um, he's also a Hertz fellow, where will the telescope be located and why? So um, I think we addressed that, but maybe. Um, uh, was, say it again. Um, um, it's going to orbit around the Lagrange point two, which, which is uh, 1.5 million kilometers farther, farther from the sun than we are. And it's going there because you can put up your one-sided umbrella and protect the telescope. It's going to be cold behind the umbrella. What is the- and, Oh, by the way, you do not elevation. escape from the Earth. You stay near the Earth. So that's good. Right, there's uh, the sort of gravitational stability point, right, be between all the different mm -hmm. bodies. Uh, so that's very unique about the L2. Um, so what, what, is the, uh, what is the actual elevation of that from Earth? in, in let's elevation. say, miles or kilometers? <clears throat> oh, it's 1.5 million kilometers away. Mm. And another way of thinking of it is going to be overhead at midnight. Right, exactly right. <laughs> so uh, that, that'll be our, our little star, dark star, um, at, at night, just like the moon is overhead at noon. Uh, I mean, uh, just like the sun is overhead at noon. So it's, a, it's the opposite thing to look for. All right, are, are there any other questions? I, ha I have a simple technical question. Um, Jim Brow from Oregon. Um, just what's the area of the umbrella relative to the area of the, of the telescope itself? Is, is the area much larger? <clears throat> yes. The Area of the umbrella is about the size of the tennis court with the corners cut off. So um, very, very much larger than the mirror itself. Thank you. Okay, we are nearing the end of our time. So uh, this will be the final question. Uh, this one is from Lynn Seppala. Um, what would a JWST with 10x larger light gathering ability be able to see? Oh my goodness. <clears throat> um, don't know exactly. If you just make it bigger, then of course it gets a sharper picture and it gets a picture quicker. Uh, uh, if you don't do something in addition, it's going to see the same things you know about, only better. <clears throat> so um, on the other hand, the National Academy of Sciences just had a giant report come out called the Decadal Survey 2020. Uh, and they recommended what we should be building next. And so they considered four giant observatories uh, ranging from a kind of super Hubble telescope up to X-ray telescopes and far infrared telescopes. And they liked them all. But they said the uh, first thing we want to push is a technology for the super Hubble. So about as big in size as the Webb telescope, but much more accurate, <clears throat> capable of doing ultraviolet astronomy and looking for those little Earth-like planets around sun-like stars directly. See the little orbit, see the little speck orbiting the other star. And that is something that is much harder than anything we've ever done before. So well worth trying. Great. I think those are in our pick future, but it'll take us a long time. Okay, so uh, right before I mentioned that last comment, um, Andrew Winkler raised his hand. Is it okay if we uh, we just uh, um, have yeah, him ask his one. question? Great, thank you. Okay, yeah. yeah, thanks. <clears throat> I heard you say that there are stars that are the same. Uh, sorry, the same size as Jupiter, um, and Jupiter has this, a similar density to the Sun. So I'm curious, do we know why Jupiter hasn't ignited? Ah, yeah, when I say the same size as Jupiter, I don't mean the same mass. Uh, these small stars that are physically the same dimension as Jupiter are actually much more massive. 
Okay. And Jupiter is too small to have too much too small a mass to compress the center to the temperature of ignition of of hydrogen into helium. Uh, but it don't have to be very much heavier to be uh, able to ignite. 